Hi, my name is Jason Bartlett. I'm an ACP2 with the Queensland Ambulance Service based in Metro North Brisbane. I'll be doing my PAR 5440 exam file video number four. The topic I've chosen for today's presentation is paediatric cannulation. So today I'll talk about um, patient preparation, the preferred sites for cannulation in the paediatric population subset, and I'll also talk about some of the tips and tricks and modifications that you use to standard techniques to um, facilitate the best chance of successful IV cannulation within the paediatric population. Needle phobia within the paediatric population is a very real phenomenon and you often need to use a large amount of effort to distract a patient, have your second office of family members try and distract a patient while you're, while you're performing a procedure of cannulation, maybe necessary to gain their trust first and can, um, ensure them that this procedure is for their benefit. One thing I've had a great deal of success with in the past, um, if you are cannulating to give analgesia, um, this was pre when we had intranasal fentanyl, we could use um, methoxyflurane to give the patient a loading dose of analgesia um, and in, then once you've given that loading dose of analgesia you can cannulate um, and then keep administering intravenous um, back in the day intravenous morphine. Um, additionally uh, sucrose in young patients and potentially up to 18 months old has been shown to provide some natural analgesia um, as well as suckling so in your very very young population that may still be suckling it could be possible um, to have the patient continue to suckle while you try and cannulate and that does provide some natural analgesia. After talking to some of the consultants, the paediatric doctors and some of the paediatric nurses up at my look like local receiving facility, um, they informed me that the preferred site for cannulation when they're cannulating paediatric patients is the dorsum of the patient's non-dominant hand. Not such an issue for your very young patients, but if they are, if they have a sort of dominance, the dorsum of their non-dominant hand um, is the preferred site. Um, typical vein that they'll aim for runs between the fourth and fifth metacarpal. Um, failing a bit if they can't cannulate the dorsum of the hands, they can use the vulvar surface of the forearm, the anticubital fossa. Um, they can also use the dorsum. Sorry, they can also use the dorsum of the foot. Um, and another site that they um, can cannulate is the great saphenous vein, which runs slightly anterior to the medial malleolus. Um, particularly in very young paediatric patients, that's a vein that um, usually shows up. So one tip that I have picked up over the years, which I'll be demonstrating on my lovely daughter Chloe, thank you sweetheart, um, who does happen to have good veins, but in some patients that don't have nicely presenting veins like Chloe's, you don't have to use a special vein light. Um, my standard lead lens that I carry with me works well. When you're actually assessing the patient's hand and when you're applying downward traction on the patient's hand, if you put your standard torch underneath, if it's intense enough, quite often it will reveal a nice vein or at least give you... Um, give you a point of access to aim for. So for this part of the presentation I'll give you a practical demonstration of cannulating the dorsum of this little pediatric patient's hand. So I've got my equipment set up over here. Um, for the purpose of the exercise I've pre-filled my um, two-way extension line. I've got my 10 mil syringe bung, some aseptic swabs. So with the very young pediatric patient, uh, one way that you can facilitate a good presentation of the vein is to get a single-handed technique and fold the patient's fingers under and get traction downwards uh, on the dorsum of the hands. The vein that I typically aim for is between the fourth and fifth metacarpal. Um, in a slightly larger patient, it's also handy if you can potentially get traction from a second person upwards um, in the opposite direction. So in terms of patient preparation, we want to ensure that we've got aseptic technique by cleaning the site effectively, it's a little bit slippery on this mannequin. So typically, especially in young patients, his immune system is not as well developed as adults. You want to swab for at least 30 seconds with a couple of different swabs. Now slightly different to the adult uh, the adult cannulation, so for this very small baby I'll be using a 24 gauge cannula. I'm um, in a slightly larger patient, we could choose to use a 22 gauge. Ensuring I've got my PPE on. So with the downward traction, so by using your finger you actually provide a natural tourniquet, so you may not even need to put a tourniquet on, however you could also apply a tourniquet um, below the elbow. So apply downward traction onto the patient. Typically we want to insert at a much shallower angle to an adult, so about 15 degrees. Um, also the, get the length of the stylet that extends past, the length of the needle that extends past the stylet is larger in um, proportion to the vein. 
So we want to do a very slow advancement into the vein. So in a, particularly in a small baby, you may not actually see flashback, but if you do get primary flashback into the chamber, it means that the end of the needles penetrated the vein, but not necessarily the stylet. So we want to, in a straight line, advance the stylet slightly further until we get secondary flashback into the sheath. And at that point, we can then advance the, the uh, stylet into the patient's vein. And we can retract it into a sharps container. And put on our bung. Ideally, we'd have at least one other person to hold the other patient's limbs so that we don't have any movement, minimising our risk of injury to the patient's veins. And once we've successfully got flashback, we can then attach our two-way extension line and with our saline flush, flush to ensure patency of the cannula. And as I said, we'd ideally we'd have a second set of hands to hold the cannula so it doesn't... Uh, we don't include the cannula or kink it. So we've confirmed patency. Uh, so with an oxide on a very small pediatric patient like this, um, the oxide may actually be too big for the patient's hand. So one of the tips that I've picked up from speaking to some of the pediatricians and consultants that they're receiving in hospitals is that with your shoes, you can actually cut the oxide in half and place that over the patient's hand and then you still have a clear visible section of the oxide that you can use to ensure that you can see the insertion site to look for any signs of extravasation of the cannula. In very small paediatric patients, although we don't have them, some of my colleagues do carry, get them from the hospital with a back splint. The idea of these is that it keeps the angle of their wrist stable so that they can't kink or occlude the cannula. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention is that paediatrics are very susceptible to pressure injuries. So it may be pertinent to put a cotton bud or a bit of gauze underneath the cannula so that you're risking the pot uh, potential for pressure injuries of the cannula onto the patient's skin. And then using tape, again, this is, has to be checked at least hourly, which is not an issue for pre hospitally but perhaps on a long transport you want to check this at least hourly to make sure that you're not getting pressure injuries under the sites of the tape. Um, and it's secured above and below the cannula. And we check that every hour at least to ensure that we still have patency and also to make sure that there's no potential pressure injuries. It may also be pertinent to strap the other hand to avoid the patient from playing with the cannula and pulling it out. It's important to note that if a tourniquet is used during the procedure of cannulation in paediatrics that they require lower tourniquet pressures than adults. And it's important not to occlude arterial flow as well as venous return. Uh, if a cannula is applied above the elbow, this can be confirmed by checking for the presence of a brachial pulse.